Hello, and welcome to another episode of Zilog and Moto. I'm your host, Dave, and this is your semi-weekly look at the English language libraries of the Sega Master System, Genesis slash Mega Drive, Sega CD, and 32X. And of course, that last one is important this week. Most of the time, I describe the channel as being focused on Sega's 8 and 16-bit console era for simplicity's sake, due to the 8-bit nature of the Zilog Z80 in the Master System, and the quasi-16-bit nature of the Motorola 68000 in the Genesis and Sega CD. But technically, technically, you could also say that this channel delves into the 32-bit realm as well, due to the fact that not only is the 68000 a hybrid 16 and 32-bit processor, depending on which part of it you're talking about, but more ostensibly, the nature of the 32X, which is built around dual Hitachi SH2 32-bit processors. Sega's goal with the 32X was clear, allow gamers to step into the upcoming fifth console generation with a low-cost expansion to the Genesis, rather than force them to pay full price for something like the Saturn, PlayStation, Jaguar, or 3DO. Of course, we all know now how that worked out, with Sega famously imploding due to Sega of America and Sega of Japan seemingly not being able to agree on much of anything, and the 32X design still relying on the aging Yamaha YM2612 aka OPN architecture for sound, which was 10 years old at that point, amongst other design problems stemming from essentially trying to graft more powerful hardware onto an existing frame. So far, I haven't covered many of the 32X offerings on the channel, and that's by design, because there's only 39 of them that I'm planning on covering, and as a result, I try to only review one or two a year just to space them out. But this week, with it being the beginning of a new season, I thought it was time to dive back into that 32X library and do something that I love doing on this channel, which is play a game that I've never played before. In fact, I really don't have much experience with this entire series, if you can call it that. Let me step back for a moment. The game of the week, as you probably saw in the title card, is Zaxxon's Mother Base 2000. At least, that's what it was called in the United States when it was released in June of 1995. It was also released in June of 95 in Europe, and then in Japan a month later. However, those versions were instead titled just Mother Base in Europe and the completely different Parasquad in Japan. Each version of the game is the same, more or less, just the names are different. You might be asking why Sega couldn't agree on what to name the game, or why in the United States it specifically is labeled as part of the Zaxxon series. And unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you. And if anyone has any insight on that, now feel free to reply in the comments. But as far as the question goes, you might as well be asking why Sega was doing anything in the mid-90s. Keep in mind, this is the same company that thought it was a good idea to try to support two supposed 32-bit consoles at the same time. If I had to guess, the reason why Sega of America decided to give the game the Zaxxon moniker is because it does sort of resemble the original Zaxxon arcade game in its isometric and 3D polygonal presentation, and Sega of America probably thought that by giving it the Zaxxon name, it would attract those same fans, and maybe in other regions, the arcade game hadn't done quite as well. Despite the SG-1000 version and Master System 3D sequel, which both appeared outside the United States. Regardless of its name, we've got a game to review. But first, a look at the package. And this is my copy of Zaxxon's Mother Base 2000 for the 32X. I keep wanting to call it Mother Base 3000 instead of 2000 for some reason. I don't know if it's because there's the 3 and the 32X that's messing me up or, or what. But anyway, this is a copy that I snagged on eBay a while back, and luckily I was able to find one that is in just beautiful condition, something that you don't always see for these post-1994 Sega Cardboard boxes, as the boxes are just really fragile and susceptible to crushing damage. But thankfully, that's not the case here, as the box is in near-perfect condition, minus a wrinkle or two in the cartridge tray. It looks so good that I half want to just leave it sealed up in the protector box, but that's not what I do here. As far as the front cover goes, I like it a lot. 
The logo at the top is very stylish and unique, although I suppose I could see someone complaining that it's a bit difficult to read. However, I think the angled font makes sense with the 3D polygonal nature of the game, and it's just an extension of the font that was used in the original arcade game. Then below, there's a great action shot of a spaceship flying away from an explosion and from just across the room. I think it looks very interesting and eye-catching. However, I do notice two things about it when you look closer. First, it appears to be a take on the famous trench scene from Star Wars, which is fine, it's not like it's a direct ripoff or anything, maybe just inspired by it. But then take a look at the shape of the ship. If you haven't played the game, you probably don't notice anything odd about it, but when you do, you'll notice that the ship doesn't resemble any of the ships that you can pilot in the game. Or maybe it does, but it's some really obscure jingly ship or something. So I thought, well, maybe the artwork was based on a previous Zaxxon game. And no, that's not the case either, as your ships in both Zaxxon and Zaxxon 3D look more like a standard terrestrial fighter jet. I can only assume that Sega of America saw the art and said, yeah, that's good enough. But when you compare the art that was used on the Japanese and European versions, which is the same art, just horizontally flipped, that artwork stands out as being closer to the actual game, albeit maybe not as exciting looking. It's close, but I do think I prefer that alternate artwork. Flipping over the back, and it's a decent layout. I don't like the screenshots overlapping, but at least each of the four is very clear, and they're all showcasing different levels in the game. As far as the flavor text and bullet points go, they're fine. I think the header does a good job of summarizing the plot of the game, and this last point, 3D scaling and rotation keeps you guessing where the next attack will come from. Well, that's definitely true in some cases, but unfortunately, not necessarily in a good way, as I'll get to in the review section. And your eyes don't deceive you, the game does support two players, but not in the way you would think. Instead, the game has an odd duel mode, where two players can attempt to blast one another if you get tired of taking on the Jingli in single player mode. Inside the box is the cartridge and manual in very nice condition like the box itself, but also, and I've got to show this, a Sega Gear poster that I don't think I've seen before. I wonder how much of this stuff was actually sold, and I'd love to see if any of these Sonic and Knuckles denim vests still exist in 2023. As far as the manual goes, Sega did a solid job here with one exception. It's still in black and white, unfortunately, but the game is explained well, and I really like the section that details all the different ship types from your side. My only issue here is that it only briefly explains your ability to combine with enemy ships as well. It would have really been helpful to have that a bit better explained and not be quite so mysterious. I do like how the manual ends with an old school high score chart page though, much like the old Master System and Genesis games used to have, so that's nice to see. Okay, that's the package, let's get into Zaxxon's Mother Base 2000 and blow up some polygons. I spoke in the intro about Sega of America's decision to call this a Zaxxon game, and after playing it, I somewhat understand why they did it, especially with them giving it the heading Zaxxons with a possessive, as in presented by Zaxxon possibly, or just tangentially related to Zaxxon, and it's not the worst idea in the world from a marketing perspective. However, the European and Japanese names of Mother Base or Para Squad are probably more appropriate. Sure, some levels have that same Zaxxon feel of being a ship trying to fight your way through a larger ship or space station, but honestly, that's pretty much where the comparisons end. It's kind of like if SNK had licensed the Zaxxon name from Sega and called Viewpoint Zaxxon's Viewpoint instead. From the outside, sure, it looks like Zaxxon just because it's an isometric shooter, but once you start playing it, it becomes apparent very quickly that this is not your dad's Zaxxon. The reason for this is that the game has significantly more depth than Zaxxon. And no, that's not some sort of 3D perception joke. Zaxxon's big gimmick at the time was elevation changes. At the time in the arcades, Galaga had taken the shooter crown from Space Invaders, but the game was still very much flat and on a single screen. A fun game to play, but not exactly immersive. Sega's idea was to change things in two ways not have the game run on a single screen, so that you're actually progressing through a wave of enemies rather than just waiting on them to come to you, and while you were doing that, to present the game isometrically, which allowed for Sega to design the levels in such a way that not only did you have to shoot at enemies, but also adjust the height of your ship that you were flying at to avoid crashing into things. 
Having your ship fly at different levels was a cool concept, and that combined with the isometric perspective definitely made the arcade machine stand out in 1982. But when you get down to it, you're still really just a ship flying through a level firing a gun at enemies. And the only strategy that you have to keep in mind is to avoid being hit, either by enemies or the background. No special attacks or anything like that, it was just pew 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 until you were done. Saxon's Mother Base 2000 takes a different approach, and it's tied in with the game's background story. Apparently, in some far-off stretch of the universe, there's an alien collective of different insectoid races that had all been living in harmony until one of the races, the Jingli, decided to be dicks and try to take over the collective so that they could be in charge of everything and everyone. Seeing as how the other races of the collective weren't exactly down with being conquered and enslaved, they put together a small rebel force to fight back, with the goal of destroying the Jingli and their supercomputer that they were using to fuel the takeover. So, sort of like Star Wars, but with insect people, I guess. Anyway, I guess due to their insectoid nature, and this is where some of the su suspension of disbelief comes in, and it is just a game after all, their ships are designed to somewhat resemble insects with various jointed features, wings, tails, etc. You start out piloting a ship called the Stinger, which is a small ship with limited firepower. And theoretically, you could try playing the whole game like this, similar to the original Zaxxon, with no bonus artillery or special attacks. However, I wouldn't recommend it, as the game instead provides other larger ships called Couriers that you can jump into, allowing you to utilize their additional firepower and alternate attacks, and benefit from the stronger nature of those ships so that you aren't destroyed in one hit like you normally are piloting the Stinger alone. The Rebels have four different types of these courier ships that you can take advantage of, and depending on the level and the situation that you're in currently, or you maybe just prefer a particular playstyle, you might want to do one of these ships over the other one. Maybe you want a stronger ship that can take more damage, but then dish it out as well. Or maybe you want a faster ship that's more nimble, but more fragile as well. Or maybe you prefer one ship's special attack over another one. Either way, the depth that this merging mechanic brings to the game is much more interesting than just flying around and shooting at things. But wait, there's more. These four ships are just the ones that are on your side. What about the fleet of the Jingli that you're fighting? Well, since originally all the insectoid races were part of the same collective, their ships are still technologically similar to yours, which means that you can merge with them as well. This merging mechanic, with both your allies and the enemies, is really cool and very original. And while I suppose someone could say it's just similar to getting power-ups in a shooter like Raiden, I think that's devaluing the concept, as you're not simply just picking up the power-up tokens as you fly over them, but you have to strategically decide which power-ups you want. Also, beyond that, with the concept of absorbing, or hacking and learning as the game puts it, from enemies, you have to be a bit more cautious about just not blindly shooting all the time, as you don't want to damage or destroy an enemy that you might need to get through the level. However, as much as I like and enjoy this aspect of the game, this is also where I've got to levy my first complaint about the game as well. The manual doesn't really make clear what your options are in regards to which enemy ships can be hacked and learned from, instead leaving that for the player to figure out on their own. And having the player figure out things on their own isn't necessarily a bad thing and can be part of the fun, but the problem is, is it's not necessarily obvious when playing the game either. In my first run of playing the game, I was expecting to see large enemy courier type ships that I could occupy, and it took about an hour and a half of experimenting to understand why the game seemed so incredibly hard, due to me attempting to take on the Jingli with just the Stinger's relatively puny default armaments. Even now that I've figured out that aspect of the game, I'm still not 100% clear on which enemies can be hacked. And I think it's the ones that have red on them, but I'm not 100% certain. Anyway, I feel like it's a miss for this not to be explained better or made more obvious to the player. I could totally see a situation in which someone plays this game, doesn't have the manual, and never realizes this is even an option, resulting in them walking away having a poor opinion of it. Once you get that game mechanic out of the way though, things start to open up a good bit, and by the time you hit level 3 and escape the confines of the various space stations, the game starts to get a larger, more epic feel, 
and the accompanying level boss sequence almost makes you forget that the game is being played on a 32X, and not a more powerful console from the 5th generation. The game has a total of 9 levels for you to fight your way through, and the end result is a game that feels like it's just the right length for a shooter. Not too short that you can just blaze your way through it in like 30 minutes, but also not too long to where it seems like it drags, or that it would be impossible to make it to the end. The game gives you 9 continues, one for each level, 5 lives per continue, and then 3 difficulty levels to choose from, and even mid-level checkpoints, so while there are certainly tricky points in each level, the game is more than fair when it comes to giving the player a challenge without just slamming the door in your face. While I'm certainly not the best shooter player in the world, the game feels well balanced, and the overall gameplay doesn't really change depending on the difficulty level, allowing players to start on easy if they want, and learn how certain level sections or bosses work before going after more difficult modes. With Saxon's Mother Base 2000 being a 32x game, we've got to talk about those graphics, right? I mean, I always cover the graphics anyway, but just go with me here. Throwing out the debate of whether the 32X is actually a 32-bit console or not, I think Mother Base 2000 looks pretty great. Like the previously reviewed Virtua Fighter on 32X, you can tell that the 32X is underpowered compared to other consoles at the time, but I don't think this looks too far off of what was appearing on the Saturn and PlayStation during that early time period. There's lots of legal action going on, with plenty of enemies and bullets flying around the screen, and only minimal slowdown just for when things get really crazy. Admittedly, the polygons are flat shaded and not textured, which looks practically archaic these days, but again, remember that we're talking mid-1995 here, and the 3D revolution was still in its infancy. I really can't complain about the quality of the graphics at all, as my issues are more with two things, the height of the camera and the occasional occlusion of the graphics leading to enemies sometimes being able to hide behind items in the environment. The latter I don't hold against the designers too much, and it's just somewhat unavoidable unless you don't have any kind of structures in the levels, which would be a bit boring. As far as the former goes, I think it would have been good to have the in-game action zoomed out just a little bit. I understand that it would cause a loss of detail, and perhaps that's why they position the camera where it is, but there's definitely a few times when it seems like being able to see more of the environment would be helpful. This is an incredibly small nitpick though, and the game is completely playable as is. The in-game sound is a bit of a mixed bag. Early on in the intro, I mentioned how 32X games more or less still relied on the sound chip in Genesis, just due to the way that everything was designed. And if you're familiar at all with sound on the Genesis, you know that that can be problematic, unless placed in the right artist's hands and allotted a decent amount of storage on the cart for high quality samples. Thankfully, for the music of Mother Base 2000, they apparently did just that, as the background music in the game sounds fantastic. If you enjoyed Yuzo Koshiro's work on the console, you're probably going to like how this sounds as well, as it has lots of upbeat techno music that fits the game action well. I wouldn't say it's as good as those works necessarily, but it's at least in the ballpark. The sound effects unfortunately got the shaft as a result, and they are just mediocre, but everything else is good enough that you probably won't even notice. Once I figured out how to properly play Zaxxon's Mother Base 2000, I quite enjoyed it. Do I think it's worth buying a 32X just to play it? No, and chances are there's probably not any games of that quality on the console, so it's probably not a fair question. However, I do think it's in the upper echelons of what's available for the console, so if you do decide to wade into the 32X in its library, this is definitely a game that you should keep an eye out for. If the power-up system was slightly more intuitive and the periodic slowdown issues were cleaned up, I think this might be a candidate for a 4-star game. But as it is, it's easily worth 3, so that's what I'm giving it. If you like shooters and own a 32X, this is a must-buy. Okay, got my 32X fix out of the way for the year with Zaxxon's Mother Base 2000. Or did I? We're only in January, so who the hell knows? Maybe I'll throw another one in later on in the season. We'll see. This was a fun game to play, and I'm actually kind of shocked that there's not more information about it out there. Not a single FAQ was found for it, and if it's got any cheat codes, they're probably lost to time at this point, unless some crazy individual decides to uh, reverse engineer some code. 
Not that either is really needed to enjoy it, I was just somewhat surprised to see that it seems to have totally flown under the radar. Next week on Zalagamoto, it is not a 32X game. It's not a Genesis game, and it's not a Sega CD game, which of course leaves the Master System. It's a game that didn't get a US release due to coming out in 1993, and is a sequel to what is easily my favorite Master System game of Season 2. Will it be just as impressive as that first game, or will it be a letdown? Well, grab your favorite magical potion and come back and find out next week. Well, that's it for Zalagamoto episode 183. If you like what you saw here and want to see more, please think about liking and subscribing if you are so inclined, as it will help more people see these videos. But most importantly, whatever you like to play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later!